Four years ago, in March 2011, the Great East Japan earthquake struck, causing a massive tsunami. The disaster left around 20,000 dead and missing. Major disasters can strike anywhere on the globe at any time. Since the dawn of the 21st century, the world has seen the 2001 El Salvador earthquakes, which destroyed or damaged 20% of the country's housing. And the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami, which killed 230,000 people across many countries around the Indian Ocean basin. The 2010 Haiti earthquake is said to have claimed as many as 300,000 victims. It caused massive destruction centered on the capital city of Port-au-Prince. Typhoon Yolanda struck the Philippines in 2013, affecting 16 million people and leaving 8,000 dead or missing. How should the international community respond to the risks, which are growing year by year, posed by major natural disasters? On March 14, 2015, the third UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction began in Sendai in Northeast Japan. The objective was to determine new international guidelines for managing disaster. High-ranking officials from UN member countries and international organizations were in attendance. At this conference, participants pledged to greatly reduce the number of victims of natural disaster by 2030. They decided on seven new themes, including reducing the economic impact of disasters. Japan pledged $4 billion in disaster prevention and reconstruction aid over the next four years. A plan was also formulated for Japan to train 40,000 people in developing countries all over the world to carry out disaster prevention management. In conjunction with the conference, JICA, the Japan International Cooperation Agency, organized a symposium entitled Disaster Risk Reduction and International Cooperation. This was also held in Sendai on March 14th. The event began with a speech from JICA President Akihiko Tanaka. No country is immune to disasters which can occur in developed and developing countries alike. Disasters in developing countries aggravate poverty and are obstacles to achieving sustainable development. To give a few examples, Hurricane Ivan cost Grenada over 200% of its GDP. And the 2010 earthquake in Haiti cost close to 120% of the island's nation's GDP. Furthermore, the social impact of disasters on the poor is immense because they make it even more difficult for the poorest to escape poverty. In Haiti, after the earthquake in 2010, the number of people living below the poverty level fell back down to 2001 level. Given these circumstances, global efforts on disaster risk reduction are ever growing. Countries and other relevant stakeholders have made progress in reducing disaster risks at local, national, and global levels. However, when looking at the type of progress that has been made, it is apparent that most of the support has been focused on post-disaster interventions, such as reconstruction and rehabilitation efforts. We have to increase investment in preventing preventive disaster risk reduction measures to build a more disaster resilient society. Japan has a long history of placing disaster risk reduction at the center of its economic and social policy. Japan has heavily invested in prevention and it is without any doubt that mainstreaming disaster risk reduction has been the foundation of Japan's economic success. Disaster risk reduction is the only way to ensure that disasters do not derail sustainable development and poverty alleviation. Today, in this symposium, just a few hours before the official opening of the UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction, I'm pleased to have 
distinguished panelists who play a central role in disaster risk reduction policy making at the global level. A panel discussion followed, starting with speakers from nations that have been hard hit by natural disasters. One such country is El Salvador. Harrison Martinez is the Minister of Public Works. In the Philippines, typhoons cause major damage almost every year. Rogelio Singson, the Secretary of the Department of Public Works and Highways, devotes himself to this issue. Speakers from international organizations included Helen Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand. Since 2009, she has been the administrator of the United Nations Development Program. The UNDP has initiatives in 177 countries and regions. It promotes economic and social progress in developing countries. Rachel Kite, Vice President of the World Bank Group, is an envoy for climate change and disaster risk reduction. With goals including development assistance and the eradication of poverty, the World Bank is active in over 120 countries. Kristalina Georgieva is part of the European Commission. Formerly of the World Bank, she is the Commission's Vice President for Budget and Human Resources. And finally, JICA President Akihiko Tanaka. JICA implements international development assistance for the Japanese government. It runs programs in developing countries around the world. Japan's expertise and technology is used in disaster risk reduction programs and in recovery and reconstruction efforts. The discussion was moderated by Toshiyuki Sato, Secretary General of Public Broadcasters International. Uh, before we go into the discussion, I'd like to share the figure of total international aid during the time 1991 to 2010. Uh, that sums up to uh, 3 trillion US dollars. And 0.1 trillion was spent on natural disasters. That is about 3.5% of the total international aid. The economic loss in the last 10 years was about $1.5 trillion. And that is 30 times of, uh, of uh, we spent on the international aid on natural disasters. That is the economic loss. And uh, uh, we have to be also reminded that uh, there are human loss that, was, that summed up to 700,000 people. Out of the natural disaster-related assistance, about 10% is spent in disaster reduction, 70% for emergency response, and 20% on reconstruction. In other words, 10% is for prevention of disasters, 70% immediately after disasters, and 20% for some time after natural disasters. Japan is a top donor in the area of natural disasters related assistance. We live with different types of natural disasters, and maybe this is why Japan is more considerate in donating aid to disaster-stricken countries. Well, I'd like to uh, uh, ask first uh, Mr. Helson Martinez. Climate change is no longer a fantasy. Climate change is not a hypothesis. It is reality, and it is frequently devastating. It is a force in motion. It does not recognize borders, nor does it recognize customs controls. From the 1980s to 2010, Central America suffered irreparable human loss from natural disaster. Over 29,407 people lost their lives. And between 1980 and 2009, economic losses caused by natural disaster amounted to 30 trillion US dollars. That's how large the impact was. 
First of all, we need to carry out a strategic shift. We need to move from the old reactive approach, where our countries were not sufficiently prepared to gather up the rubble, the dead and the injured, to a new proactive approach, one that takes sufficient preventative measures. Second, we must treat risk prevention management as a national, international and academic undertaking. We must engage the public and private sectors, citizens and communities. Third, it is important that we learn to design policy frameworks appropriate for each region. In our case, that region is Mesoamerica, Central America and the Caribbean. We must do this in order to adapt to climate change and manage our risk prevention activities. Fourth, we need to update and standardize the technical regulations related to greenhouse gas emissions. And we should make use of international agreements that dictate standards for energy efficiency. We must also effectively update technical construction regulations. This will help to protect social and industrial infrastructure, which must harmonize natural or green infrastructure with man-made grey infrastructure. These regulations should put special focus on environmental safety policy. And fifth and finally, we must learn to incorporate the best practices of others, such as the specific knowledge that Japan has gained through the efforts of the JICA organization. This will help us make our economies and societies more resilient. Uh, as far as the Philippines is concerned, when you say frequency, we're really looking at an average of 20 natural disasters every year. So it's really a matter of intensity that we're, we're addressing. So what the government has done is the creation of a national policy and uh, the, the act itself, uh, the law that created the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management. In other words, the intention is to really mainstream uh, DRRM practices. Aside from that, we also created a Climate Change Commission, which is composed of cabinet members, to make sure that the awareness is very high. Now, having said that, uh, we, the government went through, uh, we actually started, before the Yolanda, we started a pilot project on structural resiliency. Uh, but while we were preparing the pilot program, Yolanda occurred. So this gave us an opportunity to move ahead and really pursue uh, the rehabilitation under the Build Back Better policy. So we scrapped the pilot program. We went immediately into a rebuilding mode using the Build Back Better principle. The other important component is the use of technology. We, we have been working with our Department of Science and Technology and PAGASA Bureau to come up with the flood modeling and forecasting. That, to me, is very, very important because um, most of the natural disasters are, are water-related. So what we did in the area of Metro Manila, which would account for maybe as much as 40 or 50 percent of our GDP, uh, we had to prepare a master plan using the latest technology. In other words, we had to come up with flood modeling, flood forecasting, if with this amount of volume of rain in the mountains, how, how high will the rivers uh, rise? So we have been implementing the last, we've started implementing in the last two years, what we refer to as the Metro Manila flood master plan, which is a 20 year program. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Helen Clark. Well, thank you, Mr. Moderator. And uh, New Zealand, like Japan, knows more than its share of natural disasters. So it's uh, dealing with uh, disaster risk reduction and responses, something I've dealt with a great deal in my previous life. And now coming to UNDP, we are absolutely defining disaster risk reduction as a major development challenge. Because if you don't uh, endeavour to 
uh, manage your risk, you end up uh, seeing development gains often very painfully uh, won by communities, literally washed away, shaken down, uh, and this can happen in, in minutes, if not uh, hours or days, with, with, with flooding. So the approach we have taken to this uh, very, very important world conference is, if development isn't risk-informed, it's not sustainable development. And uh, we, we are really gearing up uh, with this next global disaster reduction framework to have a major push on supporting the very wide range of developing countries we work in, all of them, uh, to really maximise disaster risk reduction. I think, MC Sato, your figures in your opening statements say it all. Of all the money spent around the disaster area, 70% in immediate response, 20% on recovery, 10% on prevention. A, a tiny fraction of the total amount more spent on prevention uh, would uh, save a lot of money. And we've used the figure uh, $1 invested uh, will save seven. It's a no-brainer in terms of, of an investment. So at this meeting, we're, we're very much hoping that uh, all the member states of the UN will be focusing on what needs to be done to strengthen prevention, uh, strengthen the capacity for risk assessment, uh, for building the right regulatory frameworks, policies, institutions, community engagement, which is uh, very, very important as well. And that's a response to um, climate science, but also a response to the pattern of development, which means that we're putting more and more people at risk in coastal cities and in low-lying areas. Um, and, and that is something that we have to respond to. So unfortunately, we are in the business of disaster risk uh, management, disaster risk and resilience investment. Um, and that is going to be a growing part of our business. I say unfortunately because uh, I don't think that we've uh, we've got to the point yet where every community um, has the resources that it needs to be able to withstand these shocks and to be able to build back better. But I think that uh, what's uh, what what is really critical is that we continue to shift this debate into. Um, why it makes sense to invest now because you will save later. It's difficult. We, we know that from buying life insurance. We know that from other uh, self-evident ways in which to save money, but also save lives. And gathering here in Sendai, what we hope is that we move from talking about the economic rationale, the business case, as well as the moral imperative of investing in communities so that they can withstand shocks to actually reversing the numbers that you were talking about and making sure that the bulk of the investment actually is in, um, is, is in making communities stronger, making countries stronger, and actually pro providing an economic basis uh, for future development which is sustainable. It is not sustainable at the moment to, um, to, uh, to, to forego development aid because we are not investing in that resilience. We have uh, Ms. Kristalina Georgieva. She is uh, Vice President of European Commission for the Budget and Human Resources. I found that uh, the figure that EU has been spending on international cooperation for the uh, disaster risk reduction uh, jumped almost more than 10 times in the last several years. Uh, what, what is happening uh, inside the uh, EC uh, on, on how you deal with uh, the international uh, natural disasters? Why in Europe we are focusing so much on this? Well, first, because we in Europe are not spared by this trend towards more frequent, more devastating disasters. Not well known, but in just over 10 years, we lost more than 80,000 people to disasters, with summer heat waves being the most dangerous killer and it has costed our economies over 100 billion euros. And uh, that meant for us to turn our attention to building a resilient society in Europe by legislating, 
risk assessment. We ask all our member states to do it by building all European capacity as one so we can act together and by doing a more in cross-sectoral approaches, making resilience everybody's business. When we turn towards uh, our development partners, our philosophy has always been that development is the best resilience builder. We in Europe are 20% of the world economy, but 50% of development funding. And yet we recognize with the trends in the world that it is not good enough to simply support development. We have to integrate, especially in the most disaster-prone countries, understanding risks and preventing risks from turning into killers in our uh, uh, development cooperation. We have focused mostly on places where the risks are really horrendous. Horn of Africa, the Sahel, Haiti, parts of Latin, Latin America. And what we do is we integrate disaster risk reduction across our development programs, but we also target funding for these most vulnerable places. Just two examples for the Horn of Africa, 1.5 billion euros. For the countries of the Sahel, more than 2 billion euros, specifically to make communities stronger in the face of devastating trends. Well, on this uh, particular theme, uh, whenever I visit our partner countries all around the world, um, it's uh, uh, not uh, just uh, other people's matter when it comes to disaster. Uh, for Japanese, uh, disaster risk reduction is our own uh, affairs. And uh, one of the characteristics of uh, Japan's efforts uh, in uh, uh, international cooperation activities in disaster risk reduction is that uh, it is um, um, the expression of a sense of solidarity with the victims of uh, disasters. And so that's uh, the reason, as uh, Mr. Sato mentioned, that uh, we as a, as a country donor uh, is the largest provider of uh, disaster-related um, uh, assistance. And, uh, the second, I think, uh, characteristics of Japan's um, approach, and in particular JICA's approach, is that um, uh, we, uh, based on uh, experiences in Japan, uh, I think uh, we have uh, uh, what we might call a seamless kit of um, uh, assistance. Uh, we have uh, emergency relief uh, operations, and we have export efforts to uh, arrive into the uh, uh, affected sites to um, give advice to the affected countries. And then uh, we have tools of kits of technical cooperation activities uh, to enhance the uh, sense of uh, or planning. And then also we have um, a grant aid um, for immediate reconstruction. And we have a, uh, ODA loans uh, that could uh, provide long-standing recovery efforts. And so uh, with these uh, uh, toolkits of um, assistance, I believe that uh, we uh, can be proud of our activities uh, in our efforts uh, in the international uh, scene. Uh, but probably we should do more in collaboration uh, with the international organization and as well as uh, our partner countries in particular. How can international cooperation on disaster prevention work in practice? Let's look at the example of Higashi Matsushima, a farming and fishing community of around 40,000 people. Over a thousand people here died during the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami and 70% of the homes in the area were damaged. But now, Higashi Matsushima is using lessons from the catastrophe to benefit the international community in a variety of assistance programs. For the past two years, public officials in Banda Aceh, a city in Indonesia devastated by the tsunami in 2004, have come to Higashi Matsushima. They are here to study measures for recovery and disaster risk reduction. 
two new observers arrived in February for a three-month stay. Here they are watching the mass relocation of over 500 households to public housing. Ah, it's very good because uh, they make uh, corporations with the other countries uh, get tsunami also, and they are uh, together, learn together uh, about um, protecting the tsunami, about the culture, about the education also. The Indonesian observers visited temporary housing and saw the making and sale of ornaments. They exchanged ideas with people working their way back to independence. Higashi Matsushima's mayor, Hideo Abe, is working for a swift recovery and future disaster prevention. He wants the world to benefit from his town's experience of a tragic natural disaster. As both towns recover, we have a deep sense of mutual support with the people of Banda Aceh. We each lost much of our towns and many lives to massive tsunamis. I really hope we can share our experiences to reduce the risk of disasters elsewhere in the world. That would be great. Our two countries are dreaming about recovering. To have that kind of dream is, I think, a happy thing, a good sign. Our painful memories unite us. We can send our message to the rest of the world. And we think that message will be a powerful one, a message that will have a strong impact. I'd like to go to the other topics, the next topic. That would be how the uh, international uh, cooperation should be done for uh, mitigation of the risks. Uh, our activities, Japan's activity, JICA's activity, uh, is going to emphasize the necessity of uh, prior investment. Um, the um, first, I think, currently, uh, we would like to uh, create an economic model uh, that could uh, uh, give the estimates of uh, damage if you don't, don't invest. And uh, if you invest, then how much you could that um, um, make benefits after the disaster uh, takes place. And so these are uh, utilizing economic models. Uh, we would be able to have a fruitful discussion with our partner countries. Um, and then second, based on that, um, we uh, would like to emphasize concrete measures of prior investment. Three uh, suggestions. One very important for this conference, to have measurable targets for disaster risk reduction in terms of lives saved, in, in terms of damage prevented, in terms of infra infrastructure protected. By 2030, to ask all countries voluntarily to come with these uh, targets. So then we can concentrate attention on this topic and make the dog bark. Mm. Second, continue relentlessly to invest in assessment of risks and build bottom-up at community level and also at the national level, understanding of the danger for development. If we in Europe invest so much in development and then an earthquake or a flood or a hurricane throws the country 10 years back, our the, the purpose of this investment is gone, not to mention the misery and suffering of people. That has to be much more sent front and center. And third, we have to be clear that we have to link adaptation to climate change with the notion of prevention to disasters. Uh, the world today has awakened that climate change is not, no more a problem of the future. We have to use this awakening also to make the dog bark. So I'd like to hear uh, the other side uh, from the uh, uh, countries who have to uh, manage their, their economy and uh, the economic growth and uh, the welfare of the nation.
Today, the Ministry of Public Works and the Ministry of the Environment in El Salvador are almost like conjoined twins. Together, they play a fundamental role in protecting the people of our nation. This has allowed El Salvador, which five years ago was ranked the world's most vulnerable country, to climb eight places up the rankings. We have improved. So strengthening the role of central government in risk prevention management produces focused national policies. It creates plans and actions that are consistent and sustainable, engaging the private sector and also local governments. Of course, these policies should also take into account the role of international cooperation. In this field, El Salvador's initial achievements have been very important, including the Gensai project, which has meant the reduction and mitigation of disasters. This is a project developed by a management team specializing in adaptation to climate change, with the support of JICA. It has been a pioneering and innovative project for Central America. With this as the backdrop, I will put forward three items in relation to international cooperation. One, I think we are not sufficiently focused on the prevention of disaster. It is important that our countries pay attention to disasters, but the key is the prevention. The key is avoiding tragic outcomes. Foresight and prevention allow us to deal with contingencies and support both ourselves and other countries to successfully achieve our objectives. The second point is that island countries or those on an isthmus, which is the case in Central America, suffer some of the worst effects of disaster. Central America only emits 0.5% of the world's greenhouse gases, but we are among the countries that are most affected by disaster. We are the ones who suffer the extreme impacts associated with climate change. It is therefore important that countries like us have a voice, that we are directly involved, and that we are able to help guide where the funds for adapting to climate change are applied. Third and finally, it is my hope not only that each country fulfills its own responsibilities, but also that the world fulfills its responsibility as a whole. We need to take on effective shared responsibility in protecting our planet. Thank you. We are now developing or ramping up investments in infrastructure we started at less than 2% of GDP. We've ramped it up to 5% by 2016. That's fourfold in terms of actual absolute amount. And in, in that process, what we've done is precisely because of this mainstreaming of DRRM practices, we have upgraded and come up with new structural designs and standards for our public facilities. That's from roads, school buildings, hospitals, uh, municipal buildings, and so on. So we have increased substantially our uh, investments. It used to be the classroom that could only withstand 150 kilometers per hour. Now we've redesigned that to withstand 250 kilometers per hour. So that means a at least 30% increase in investment to us that's really uh, biting the bullet and investing in prevention. Well, uh, I'd like to uh, develop the uh, idea of uh, uh, international assistance, uh, how, how the international assistance should be uh, uh, made. And the Japan and the Philippines uh, uh, started a very interesting scheme or idea called Build Back Better. The idea, I understand, is to spend money, and uh, the money should be worth it. And uh, I mean, after the uh, uh, devastation. And, but still, the money shouldn't be spent on the same manner that, the, that they reconstruct the same thing. It should be 
it, it should add something else. That is, I think, the basic idea of the Build, build Back Better. Build Back Better concept um, is an um, idea to transform uh, the disaster into an opportunity to uh, make necessary prior investment. Other than, well, in addition to responding to the immediate needs, uh, we uh, need to utilize uh, the disaster and opportunity uh, to uh, make necessary investments so that we could prevent uh, further uh, devastation in the future. And then I think the Filipino government uh, took the opportunity uh, or the disaster of uh, Typhoon Yolanda as an uh, important uh, opportunity to uh, make necessary investment. Build Back Better uh, is, well, in a way, easy said than actually done because of the financial uh, constraints. Um, I was told by um, people in Kobe, uh, immediately after Hanshin Awaji uh, great earthquakes, uh, when the, um, the people in Kobe insisted that we should recover much better, but then there, there are a lot of constraints. And so um, the governor of uh, Hyogo and mayor of Kobe uh, you, you created the concept of creative recovery, creative reconstruction. I think this creative recovery, creative reconstruction is, uh, in a way, the, the paraphrase of uh, what we call uh, build back uh, better. And this is uh, very important uh, uh, whenever we uh, construct development activities around the world, um, utilize every opportunity uh, so that uh, we could make necessary investments to uh, prevent uh, future disaster. Thank you very much. Uh, the recipient case with uh, the Philippines, uh, does it work? Uh, definitely it does. Uh, as I mentioned, in the regular budget, now I'm talking not anymore recovery, but regular budget, for example, the cost of school buildings is a little higher than what we used to invest. but definitely this is worth it. The design is much better. Uh, it can withstand 250 kilometer winds as against the 150 in the past. So it's not just in the reconstruction, but even in new construction. We have, for example, uh, our, our roads. As we construct, we have also upgraded them, uh, higher investment, but we feel that we can also use some of these roads as road dike, I think. As you move around Sandai, you'll see a lot of the road dikes that really protected some of these uh, vulnerable portions of uh, the city. And that's what we are doing. Instead of just reconstructing the road, we're using the roads in Tacloban, for example, together with JICA, we're redesigning the road to elevate it and use it as a road dike. So these are some of the measures that really will mean prevention. And I'm reminded of uh, of uh, being in, in Haiti and meeting with uh, uh, people living in uh, poor communities uh, down the sides of uh, hills in the capital, uh, which had suffered uh, serious damage. And the question was, well, well how, to, how to rebuild? And the communities were being very involved in where you should rebuild, where you shouldn't, and then how you would do it. And that's an opportunity to bring in the women's perspective as well, because the women were saying, well, actually the way our community was, wasn't very safe for us out with our physical security. So as you rebuild, would you put the street lights here and would you put them there? Because these were where the, the, the danger spots for us uh, were. So I, I think you know, building back better is, is absolutely essential. Well, uh, to round up uh, today's discussion, I'd like to ask each participant uh, to make your last statement. Well, I think there are <clears throat> three things we need to focus on as an international community in solidarity uh, around uh, the, the dilemmas that we face with uh, increased intensity um, and frequency of, um, of disasters. One is that there has to be a coherence um, in, in our approaches uh, amongst partners, uh, but uh, amongst you know, those of us who live perhaps in a safer place and our respect for the lives of the most vulnerable and 
uh, and the, the remarkable generosity of many people around the world, Europeans, the Japanese, um, who uh, Australians, New Zealanders, who, who give in addition to the aid and other flows remarkable amounts of money every year in response to the television pictures that they see. So th there is an ability through this a sense of needing to invest in resilience and building back better that we can build uh, a new sense of solidarity and a new sense of coherence. The second is that we have to have policies and flows of money which are user-friendly. If you're the Minister of Finance of, a, of a, a country which is vulnerable and being buffeted by more frequent disasters, then you need to be able to access funds quickly and easily uh, with the same rules and different terms and conditions. And there's a lot for the international community to do to make this just more user-friendly. And then third is that our collective ambition has to be equal to the sense of the problem. And we have to leave Sendai with a reinstated sense of ambition. We have to work in partnership. We can do so. Japan has put a remarkable amount of resource into partnership, uh, and we can all learn from, from that lesson. But we are looking at down the barrel of a very difficult situation if we don't uh, adhere to these sort of three, uh, three points, because the chemistry of the planet has been altered. Mm. This is warming the ocean. This is speeding up the winds. And through no fault of themselves, no fault of their own, many people now find themselves in harm's way. We have a responsibility, a moral one, but we have a sense of economic and fiduciary responsibility to be able to invest in this world, to be able to cope with this new chemistry and this new reality. And we have to double down on that problem here in Sendai. Well, I, th I think partnerships are absolutely critical in moving forward, uh, and uh, developing country governments need coordination among the partners as well, rather than everybody coming at them with a, uh, a separate set of ideas. I think the work that's been done uh, across uh, UN, EU, and World Bank on the disaster needs assessment after the events have been very important in coordinating uh, support and, and, of course, building back the, the building back better uh, element into that. Uh, also on partnerships, let's not forget uh, that a lot of the uh, disasters can't be effectively tackled uh, in one country. If you're looking, for example, at the floods which uh, ravaged uh, parts of the, the, the Balkans, uh, uh, the Croatian, Bosnian, Herzegovina, Serbia floods, those downstream needed partnerships with countries upstream, which may have been around reforestation, uh, dealing with forest degradation, uh, to, to mitigate the downstream effects. So uh, an, often we see uh, these issues also arising uh, in uh, areas where cooperation hasn't been so strong for a range of reasons, but trying to get partnerships between countries who may not have been on the best of terms to tackle a common threat, I think, will be uh, extremely important. But I think if we're systematic, we can all see that you move uh, from the, the gathering of the best information and assessments and evidence to the designing of, the, of the, the best responses around the institutions, the policies, the planning, the capacities, I'd like to ask Mr. Simpson to have your statement. I cannot thank the international community. Uh, we have really been, we really appreciate all the support and all the assistance after Yolanda. And I cannot thank them, uh, all, the, all the communities that have helped us. The second item I'd like to mention is that definitely uh, sharing the best practices and available technology from the international community will hasten mainstreaming of the disaster risk reduction management programs. And third, um, may, it is important, the coordination aspect is very important among international humanitarian and uh, multilateral agencies, especially at the ground level. Uh, let me share with you an experience where in one day I would meet maybe eight or ten multilateral agencies in one day, uh, of course advocating their different uh, uh, expertise. That needs a lot of coordination at the ground level. So I, I think uh, if there's any output that could be done 
among the multilateral and international agencies for closer coordination with the communities can help a lot. Mr. Martinez, please. First, it would seem that nature is trying to tell us something. It's telling us that the traditional model of economic growth, which has led to the degradation of the environment, has also led to human-generated climate change. It's important that we change our way of thinking. Very important. Also, and here's my second point. We must take disasters as important opportunities. This was the approach that was put forward here at this symposium. We have an opportunity here. And it will be possible if we act in concert. If we do this, the world map of threats will not make life fatally vulnerable for us. Rather, it will spur us to create resilient societies, resilient economies, and resilient countries. And the third point is, once again, a move towards prevention. This includes the contingency funds that some countries have and that they must use to stimulate the preventative measures that will avoid future humanitarian crises. In this short time, three very straightforward messages. The first one is that as human civilization, we have to brace for a world that is becoming much more fragile than the one we were born in. We have to learn to think of the unthinkable. And that thinking of the unthinkable, we can only do together. That requires global solidarity of a magnitude uh, that, that I think here we are trying to build, but I don't think we have gotten to it. We have to get there. My second message is that we also have to think of the most vulnerable, the women, the children, the elderly, the handicapped. As we build responses, as we work on preparedness, have them in our hearts, in, in our minds. And my third message is one of hope. We people are very inventive. If we put our minds on something, we actually get it done. And invention is on not only high science, it comes bottom up from our communities. Um, in dealing with uh, natural disasters, um, investment in prevention is very important. Uh, building back better is very important. Mainstreaming disaster risk reduction is very important. And for all these, international cooperation is very, very important. And when it comes to international cooperation, I believe uh, it is a two-way street. And uh, those uh, who are working with partner countries are also learning many, many uh, things. JICA staff is learning very much from our activities in uh, cooperation in the Philippines and in El Salvador and in many other countries. I think uh, by participating in these international cooperation activities, we gain a lot uh, for the benefit of Japan uh, too. And one, I think, concrete uh, thing that uh, Helen and others um, mm -hmm. mentioned, I uh, completely agree. I think uh, when it comes to planning, and community, um, uh, or making community more resilient, uh, participation of women is very, very uh, important. I think uh, this, I think we, the, the Japanese, uh, we uh, feel uh, somewhat uh, wanting. Um, and then uh, based on our experience in the East uh, Japan Great Earthquakes, I think uh, sometimes uh, planning uh, or Japanese prior investment had been made without uh, much participation by women. And uh, we should have uh, uh, had more opportunity of participation of women. Uh, if we had done that, we could have done much better. And uh, we are going to uh, learn uh, from our experiences. Thank you very much. Mm.